The Patriot Act gives exceptional powers to the FBI aimed at helping them foil terror plots. Civil liberties advocates have long maintained that the Patriot Act goes too far and tramples privacy and constitutional principles. But which provisions ought to go and which should stay? Julian Sanchez, a research fellow at the Cato Institute, discussed the Patriot Act at a policy forum held December 3, 2009. Now, it's not just that I think that the FBI has some kind of unhealthy interest in the movements or reading habits of ordinary Americans, although there is ample historical reason to be concerned about that. Um, rather, it's that our capacity to fruitfully collect and analyze massive amounts of data has grown with both technology and the sophistication of our analytic mathematical tools. Right. Um, what we are now capable of doing is sorting and collating information about populations to narrow our investigation down on particular targets. We can do fairly sophisticated social graph analysis to look for patterns of communication that might identify anonymous individuals by their telltale sort of social fingerprint, or to reveal facts about organizational structure and potential group membership. Uh, something that I think has actually been far too little discussed is the First Amendment implications of this kind of social network analysis. The Supreme Court has held in, in case after case that there are First Amendment free association and expression implications to membership lists, like the list of people who are members of a particular NAACP uh, office, uh, you know, chapter. Um, and and that, that has really, I think, been overwhelmingly missing for analysis, in part because we haven't been forthright about what the capabilities of these tools now are. Um, so what's, what's the, 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 the fruit of this kind of mass analysis? Uh, we have a terrorist watch list with at least 400,000 individuals on it and growing fast. 20,000 of those, at least, uh, are, are uh, Americans. We have an FBI database with at least 1.5 billion records from a plethora of private and uh, public sector sources. Um, and we also have a set of statutes governing more intrusive communication surveillance that have been shaped to uh, more easily take the fruits of that kind of broad-based investigation uh, and collection of data as a sort of input uh, to guide its targeting. So we mentioned roving wiretaps. Um, right? In the criminal context, roving wiretaps exist. They allow you to follow a target from uh, phone to phone or internet account to internet account. But the courts have consistently found that this kind of broad authority meets the particularity requirements of the Fourth Amendment, which requires that the um, places to be searched and the things to be seized be particularly described in a warrant. Because in the criminal context, there is a requirement that when a wiretap goes roving, um, the specific speaker or target is named, and it is just that person's communications which may be monitored. That, that limitation does not exist for FISA roving wiretaps, which may be issued uh, to include no, specific, no specification of the phone line location or um, internet account monitored, but also to contain only a description of a group being monitored, um, right? Which means, in a sense, uh, an ability to provide the characteristics uh, of, of a group membership that will be used without uh, limitation by facility. Uh, even more broadly, thanks to the FISA Amendments Act passed last year, the FISA court can now approve not specific targets of surveillance, but programs of surveillance where the judicial role is only to authorize targeting procedures, which means, again, a shift from particular individual targets to authorization of algorithms for targeting, of abstract characteristics that are to be used to identify whose communications may be surveilled. Now, uh, fans of the Patriot Act, I don't have anyone in particular in mind, but we have a couple here, um, like to say, you know, I'll tell you what. What we need to do is uh, worry about limiting these powers uh, if it happens that this extraordinarily covert surveillance ever results in abuses that we somehow learn about. Um, they, they don't say this usually when the abuses are actually uncovered, but, but they suggest that this is our standard. Um, and I, I think this is a mistake in, in a couple of, of really basic ways. First, very simply, uh, the default should not be unfettered government power, right? The, 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 
Our decision procedure should not be to insist on a justification for civil liberty safeguards. Uh, what we need to insist on is an explanation of why those safeguards are unacceptable, right? It is utterly inadequate to simply say, we seem to be catching a bunch of terrorists, the Patriot Act must be working, uh, and it must be the case that all of the hundreds of components of the Patriot Act, exactly in their current form, are totally essential to this task. In fact, if we actually look at the causes of intelligence failure in the past, um, they, they tend not to be um, you know, inadequate power, even though that's a convenient scapegoat, but structural problems within intelligence agencies. If we look at the reasons for intelligence success, it is, uh, again, far more often good human intelligence based on specific targets that leads to the apprehension of terrorist targets. Um, so I think we need to shift the burden here and say, look, um, find me a case where a common sense limitation that will narrow the applicability of an investigatory tool to people actually suspected at least of second order links to terrorists, that is, at least you know, to, to being in communication with someone you suspect of being a terrorist, show me how that limitation would actually have hampered a successful investigation, and we will have a discussion about the appropriate contours of civil liberties safeguards. Um, the other real problem, though, I think, is, is that there is a structural issue here, right? It's not just particular abuses we need to be concerned about. Frankly, it's what happens when the law is used precisely as intended. Right? A myopic focus on particular abuses neglects the structural component of privacy rights. We understand this in the First Amendment case, right? We understand that uh, the right to free speech is not just about my individual liberty to express my views. It's about the structural infra interest I have as a member of a democratic society subject to democratic laws of public free discussion of matters of public import, whether or not I'm interested in taking part in that discussion. And there's every reason to think that the founders understood privacy and the rights protected by the Fourth Amendment to have a similar structural role. If you look at the history of abuses of intelligence powers, it is in fact uh, overwhelmingly that political function that has been imperiled uh, by, by misuse of surveillance powers. Um, so with that more structural take in mind, um, I, I, think, I think we need to consider not just what are the harms that might accrue now, but what is the architecture of control? Right? I mean, if you know anything about Joe the Plumber's child support records, you have a sense of how surveillance can be used as a tool of discipline. Um, and if we look to the architecture of surveillance we're constructing, I think we will recognize that the appropriate test here is not short-term expediency, but whether that level of filtering analysis of data about increasingly legible populations is consistent with a structure of government that is appropriate for a free people. Julian Sanchez is a research fellow at the Cato Institute. You can read more of his work and watch the full forum at cato.org.